Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Gordon Simpson about DHL's talent investment last year, as well as the changes he foresees in the logistics human resource strategy for 2021 and 2022. Gordon Simpson, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you, Jonathan. It's great to have you. I'm excited to have this conversation and really dig into the example and kind of the the live case study of what DHL has been doing over this past year to retain talent in the logistics industry amidst this pandemic. Uh, It's, you know, as COVID-19 continues to change and shape industries globally, HR teams have had to adapt and create strategies to retain and simulate employees who are now working from home. Uh, And obviously this shift has particularly affected your sector, the logistics sector, which prior to the pandemic relied on in-person operations to carry out everything that they do day to day. And so this will be the topic of conversation for today. I really look forward to hearing more about what DHL has been up to and what you've been doing in this HR space. Uh, Before we launch into the dialogue, I wanted to share Gordon's bio with everybody. Gordon Simpson is the Senior Vice President and Head of Human Resources for the DHL Global Forwardings Americas region based out of Miami, Florida. He is also the Global Employee Relations Lead for DGF. In 2006, Gordon began working at DHL as Senior Vice President of HR for the Asia Pacific region. He led the integration of 21 Asian Pacific countries following Deutsche Post acquisition of Excel, as well as number of sub- subsequent reorganization efforts. He was instrumental in developing and implementing a regional HR strategy to align with division and global strategies. He relocated to the US to assume his current role at the start of 2012. Prior to joining DHL, he worked in HR for various companies around the world in oil, chemical, and shipping industries, and has lived in South Africa, Thailand, Singapore, and the US. A man after my own heart, international man of mystery, and I, I love all of the, the global experience and travel that you've been engaged with and what you continue to do globally, you know, on a global scale in the HR space. Uh, thank you for joining me and welcome to the podcast. Anything else you would like to share by way of background or personal context with us before we launch into the conversation? No, I, I thank you for that, uh, that, that glowing introduction and uh, more than happy to, to just kick off and get straight into it. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's let's start with uh, a little bit of the context at DHL. I, I suspect people listening probably understand what the company is and what you do, but maybe just a really quick um, crash course into DHL, um, what you do, the logistics side of things, and then we can start to get into more of the the HR elements, particularly during the pandemic and moving to a more virtual work. Okay. So DHL um, is part of the Deutsche Post DHL group. There are a number of operating divisions, uh, Post and Parcel, which is essentially the the German postal service. Uh, We have the Express division, which is is really, uh, you know, the primary competitor of of the likes of of FedEx and UPS. Um, We have our supply chain division, which is largely uh, domestic uh, warehousing and transportation. we have the global forwarding business, which is uh, the part of the business that I'm involved in. That's the freight business. It involves movement of product by road, rail, sea, or air. Uh, and then we have our e-commerce uh, division, which, um, you know, under the uh, pandemic uh, circumstances, has, has certainly uh, come to the fore with what has been happening over the over the past year. So that, in a nutshell, is is DHL. 
Uh, it's a massive organization. We are the most international company uh, in the world, seemingly. We uh, operate in over 220 countries. We have over 570,000 employees. Uh, here in the Americas region, in aggregate, we're, uh, we're probably over 120,000 people. Um, our division is, is by far the smallest. We, um, uh, we have about 8,000 people across this region. Um, and in, operate in, in most of the countries uh, across this particular region. Now, when the pandemic started, um, you know, we were in the very fortunate position in transportation and, uh, and logistics that we were deemed an essential service. And as a consequence of that, we continued to operate um, you know, over this past year. Um, clearly, people that worked in, in those uh, customer facing roles, uh, whether those were careers in our, in our express division or people working in, the, in our warehouses where we were needing to move freight and so on, those people continued in, in those roles uh, from the get-go. Um, what we did, though, was that when um, the pandemic really hit uh, here in the U.S., what we started to do was get people to work from home. And, uh, and the vast majority of the people that could work from home um, started doing that uh, very soon after the, um, the middle of March. And what really amazed me was that from a technology point of view and from just the ability of, of the, the company and the organization to continue to run the business effectively, it was quite remarkable how, how smooth that transition was with hindsight. Now that's not that's not denying that there, there were a number of issues that we had to address. Um, obviously, we we needed to get protocols put in place very very quickly. Um, now that a year has passed, it's it's hard to believe that that was the case. But uh, you know, paramount for us was the the health and safety of our employees. So all of those uh, conditions regarding you know keeping people safe at work were uh, were really um, tackled head on right from the get go. Um, and I think, you know, that was evidenced when we look at the, at the overall number of people that, that were infected and subsequently um, recovered. But I think from an HR point of view, more critical than that was that, you know, working from home and managing people in a virtual environment was, was something pretty new to many, many people. Um, and obviously, one of the key things there was, you know, understanding the implications of that. So if you think about you know, what happened to people that had school going children where they were suddenly being required to educate their children on a on a virtual basis, or you had people that had, um, you know, maybe were single parents and had, uh, you know, the issues of taking care of their kids at home and, and trying to, to manage their job and their life. Um, it, it was extremely difficult. And, you know, one of the things that we wanted to, to be sure that we were doing was staying connected with people on a regular basis. So that the things that we would normally do, you know, in, in, a, in a work environment where people were actually coming into the office, we continued to do many of those things, but we did them in a virtual way. And I think that that helped enormously just keeping people connected to the organization, reinforcing the notion that, you know, what they were doing was critically important, certainly in terms of, you know, keeping the world moving. Um, and if you look at DHL or DPDHL's purpose, um, which, which very simply stated is connecting people, improving lives. Um, I think that that bit was extremely uh, important during this whole period. Uh, and what, what certainly struck me is that, you know, as a, as a kind of purpose-driven organization, that was the first time, I think, that on a global scale, that this really is something that, that employees across the world could, could buy into and really understand you know, what it was that we were doing, whether that was moving PPE from China into the, into the US or elsewhere in the world uh, at the start of the pandemic, or whether it was, you know, getting shipments of, um, of critical stuff uh, to people around the world um, during the pandemic. And then finally, this, this issue of distribution of the vaccines. Um, I think it's been really important because, you know, people suddenly start appreciating uh, you know, the value that the organization brings um, and, and really in terms of that, you know, that, that purpose um, of, of improving lives and, and, and helping people on a global basis uh, with the work that we do on a, on a day to day basis yeah. was critically important. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for that background uh, and kind of the crash course introduction to 
the DHL logistics uh, environment as, as you move into a virtual world uh, during the pandemic. And it, one of the things you said there towards the end, the, the purpose-driven component to the organization, I think is very powerful. You also mentioned uh, earlier on about the priority that DHL leadership put on the health and safety of their people. Um, now, maybe everyone listening, you know, is thinking, well, duh, of course, you know, you need <laughs> to look at the, look out for the self and he the health, health and safety of your people, but that's easier said than done. And, and there are so many challenges uh, around doing that, not just the physical health, but the mental health and the stress and anxiety issues, uh, everything surrounding <clears throat> this, this moment. And to your point of, you know, parents working from home, I have six children working from home, my wife working from home, trying to school my six children from home man, that's, that's hard work. Um, and so this, this environment that we all found ourselves in was new, nobody expected it. Yet I, I, I applaud uh, you and your team and everyone at DHL for, for, you know, for this to be able to be such a smooth transition. Um, I think everyone was forced into this, right? Uh, like the, you had to flip the switch and kind of move virtual almost overnight. And there's so many growing pains around that. Um, but some organizations did it much better than others. And it sounds like uh, the the purpose driven nature of your organization and the employee centric um, values of your organization helped you perhaps to manage, you know, the, the, the shift and the change a little bit better than some organizations um, who, who really struggled with it. Uh, and I'm also struck by the you know, for the essential worker element that you were discussing and the role of companies like yours in the distribution of the PPE and the, the, the vaccine and such. Um, I, I think those sorts of elements aren't a minor thing in the minds of the, the line employees who show up, put their health at risk. Um, they, 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 they know the importance of what they're doing and how it's going to make a difference. And whether we're talking about DHL employees, or we're talking about any other organization, anyone listening to this podcast today, your own organization, you need to be thinking about how do you connect your people to that grander purpose, um, that sense of meaning and purpose that will uh, help them weather these types of challenges and stressful and, and anxiety ridden times. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit more specifically then about the logistics side of DHL um, and looking at uh, the HR component in relation to those logistics and in, in, in attracting, retaining, and you know, uh, engaging and motivating your people during this really rough year um, amidst all these constraints. Uh, what, what were some of the things that, that you and your team at DHL did to try to tackle that? I think there were a couple of things and, and, and the three kind of big buckets that, that maybe we're talking a little bit about. I mean, one is, is around, you know, the, the, the retention issue. So retention in the sense that, you know, under normal circumstances where people would, you know, attend uh, training programs and the like, you know, one of the things that we found very soon after the, uh, um, the middle of March of, of 2020 was that, you know, we couldn't just stop many of those activities in their tracks. So we, you know, so much of the training and development activities that we would normally do face to face, we had to figure out ways to be able to do that virtually. I, at that stage, I, I can still recall, you know, I had some misgivings about that initially. And, you know, those fears uh, were certainly allayed very quickly when we started doing it. And some of the programs that I participated in you know, I realized that, you know, that transition from face-to-face -to, -face to, to virtual learning was a lot easier than, than I'd anticipated. And if it's done in a way, you know, where, where you're not sitting on the phone for, for eight hours, you can, you can break it down into, into more bite-sized chunks. It made a huge difference. And I think that transition for me was, was quite significant, right? I, and I was really impressed with, with the way we were able to do that almost seamlessly. So that was the one area. The, the other one, you know, and, and something that obviously uh, I think, you know, was, was probably centered in the US, but obviously a global phenomenon. You know, we talk about trying to create an inclusive workforce. And, and as you know, with the, the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that went on around diversity, uh, equity and inclusion, 
last year was a, was a real wake up call. And, and oftentimes, you know, in, in situations where you're able to, to sit down and have face to face discussions with people on some of those kind of topics, it tends to be a lot easier. So we had those issues to deal with. I think we dealt with it extremely well from the point of view of, of being able to, to get those topics on the agenda and really drive uh, some of the, uh, the discussion around, uh, you know, particularly the, uh, the diversity and inclusion thing. And, and you know, we do uh, have a lot of um, specific KPIs that we measure, particularly in terms of, you know, um, you know whether it's race or gender or, or uh, you know, ability or disability. Um, many of those topics that we that we talk about on a, on a regular basis to ensure that we stay connected. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership. Ordinary, everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data-driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. The other one is around, you know, maintaining and engaging people. And, and you know, um, our Express Division, for example, is, is in... in um, Great place to work is, this, is ranked number two globally. Um, that varies from place to place around the world. But, you know, likewise, in, in our organization where, where we are part of the top employer um, organization, we, we have that uh, um, top employer status across our region and, and in most of the countries that we operate in. So, you know, we've, we've put a lot of time and effort into maintaining those um, actions and activities that we would normally do if people were going into the office on a regular basis. So we've been able to maintain all of that, just doing it in a virtual way and, and being sensitive to the fact that, you know, we do have to manage slightly differently. When it comes to to, to that engagement piece, you know, our philosophically as an organization, we, we really take the view that, you know, engaged employees um, result in engaged customers and obviously, uh, you know, drive the bottom line. Um, so when you think about, you know, connecting the dots for, for people in our, our business where we've, you know, for the past probably 10, 12 years been talking about the three bottom lines that we have about being a, uh, you know, an employer of choice, uh, an investment of choice, uh, and a provider of choice, uh, we've been able to translate that pretty well during this pandemic period. And I think it's, for us, it, it certainly worked particularly well. Um, you know, one of the big, big topics that, uh, that that is starting to emerge, I think, as part of this is around sustainability. And, and when you look at the three key pillars of, um, you know, the environment, the social and the governance parts of that, you know, I think it's become even more prevalent, um, you know, over the uh, over the past year while we've been in this kind of lockdown mode. So that is going to be a, a key area going forward. And I think it, it, it's going to help us um, enormously in being able to, to connect the dots even further. And when I think about it, you know, when, when we first put the protocols in place back in March uh, last year, you know, the notion that, you know, by June, everybody would be back in the office. Well, we're now in March uh, 2021. Uh, and um, we, we certainly, you know, have have had to change that thinking on uh, on many occasions. But 
the reality is that for us, it's, it's worked pretty well. Yeah, well, that, that's great. I appreciate you outlining those three broad areas. And you're right, this has gone on longer than I think most people had thought or certainly had hoped. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, it, it was pretty stark this past week when we hit the one year mark of, of, of all of, of, of the World Health Organization announcement of the pandemic and, and uh, the lockdowns and, and everything around that. And it's, it's a little bit surreal to look back on this past year and to think about, you know, what, what has happened. And uh, you, you mentioned also the, the Black Lives Matter. We had, we, uh, we have the, uh, the political unrest, uh, you know, around in an election year in the U.S. and the the aftermath. There were just so many things that that made it a really really tough year. Uh, and so I applaud your efforts towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. I applaud your efforts towards employee engagement and really focusing on um, the 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 mental and physical health of your people. Uh, I think that's really important. It's a good lesson for for everyone listening. You know what what can we do? You know, of course, the, the bottom line issues are important, um, but it's not just profit, as you mentioned. Like, there are other elements that are key. And if, if we start to forget um, those other elements and particularly how they relate to our people, then we're going to erode at the trust uh, within our organization. We're going to erode, um, you know, the, the, the capital that we've built up with our people uh, to be able to accomplish really great things, and ultimately the sustainability of the organization is going to suffer. Uh, and I and I think that's happened with a lot of organizations. You know, admittedly, put in a really tough situation um, that no one was really ready for. Uh, but some organizations just simply weren't up to the challenge of dealing, you know, with the complexities of that moment. And uh, because of it, you know, they lost some really good people, uh, or or perhaps have even had to close their doors. Uh, so it, it, these are the ongoing challenges that we face, you know, as the pandemic continues. And now, you know, everyone's saying hopefully by June of 2021, we'll we'll uh, be out of the woods and things will get back to normal a little bit more. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Um, but certainly we, um, we we've learned a lot of lessons. I think this this past year, if if you had to oh, go ahead, go ahead. I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I was, I was just going to say, you know, and while all of this was going on, there were certain countries that. Uh, you know, um, had had uh, natural disasters to, to cope with, right? And and you might remember that in Honduras they they were hit with two hurricanes within two weeks. Um, you know, we we, uh, we had a number of employees who who we had to move from their homes to higher areas and so on. And I, I can still you know recall um, you know being sure that that you know the employees were safe in a in a in a very different uh, set of circumstances. Um, you know, they were dealing with COVID and social distancing and what have you, and suddenly this uh, befell them. Um, but, you know, the, the, the response from the organization was, was quite unbelievable. You know, we, for example, in the US, um, you know, at, at many of our locations, we said to people, you know, if you have, um, you know, clothing or foodstuffs or whatever that you could potentially contribute that we could move to, to our colleagues in, in Honduras, um, you know, that would be tremendously appreciated. We were staggered with the kind of response that, uh, that took place. Um, you know, we, we also set up a, a GoFundMe um, page for people to contribute to, to their colleagues. We have, a, we have a global program called We Help Each Other so that where these things happen, you know, from a, a global corporate perspective, we, we provide assistance. So the, it, it was just incredible to see the response of the organization to some of those things, even under the you know, the very difficult circumstances that people were, were already finding themselves in. And that, that to me was tremendous. And I, I think you used a word earlier, trust, um, you know, and, and that trust thing is, is uh, there's, a, there's a high level of reciprocity on that, you know, whether it's with your employees or whether it's with your customers or anybody else where, you know, you do what you say you're going to do. Um, it, it's critically important. And I think we've had many opportunities as an organization to reinforce that over the past year. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's wonderful. Um, with all the positive things that have happened amidst the the challenges and the hardships, um, what what are maybe one or two things that were really difficult that um, that you hadn't anticipated that uh, you feel like ultimately perhaps you were able to to come out better on the other side, but were really 
challenges in dealing with you know this virtual uh, environment while trying to carry out something as physical and tangible as logistics? Yeah, you know, if I think about it, I think the challenges, you know, obviously from a business point of view, there were there were a number of challenges because, you know, in the immediately following the the implementation and you think about what happened, uh, you know, for example, to air travel. Now, you know, thinking that for every aircraft that flies with uh, with people, you know, above the wing and the belly of that aircraft is probably freight that is moving as well. And so the you know the impact of that and the and you know the closure of many plants and stuff that occurred across the globe um, meant that you know our our volumes were severely impacted, but there were there were places for example with our chartering business where where people had to move stuff around the world, you know under conditions that were were very tough at the at the start of the uh, the pandemic, so you know there there were responses that we we had to. To look for solutions, um, and and we were able to find them, but you know it it is going to take some time, I think, for for the world to recover. Um, certainly, when when you look at um, some of the capacity constraints that that we were dealing with as a logistics company, um, were, were very tough, right? But we were able to to find ways to overcome that, um, and I think we 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 did really well with that. Um, you know the the. I suppose one of the really positive things for us is that we we didn't need um, to to a very very large extent um, to lay people off because of uh, you know of of a complete decline in business or a, or a reduction in business. There there, there were occasions when uh, you know we, some people had to be furloughed and so on, but it was not for extended periods. And I think we you know we were able to get through that um, pretty well. Uh, but certainly in, in terms of challenges, I think the, one of the biggest things for me was, you know, keeping people's spirits up. Um, and, you know, when you think about um, the, the social aspects where, where people for months on end had very little face-to-face -face contact with people, um, that was really difficult to deal with. And I think, we, you know, what we, what we started was... Uh, was bi-weekly calls that we were having, you know, not only at a at a departmental level and so on, but but also, you know, in our regional headquarters, for example, where with ninety five percent plus of the people were working from home, you know, how do you how do you keep people informed? How do you keep them engaged? How do you keep them connected uh, and so on? And and it it was amazing to me. I mean, I, I I was enormously surprised and very pleased to see that the vast majority of people called into those Skype calls that we would arrange and um, and actively participate. So it, it worked pretty well. Um, but uh, other challenges, I think, in the earlier days, when, when we were first doing the implementation and, and, you know, dealing with the anxiety of people that were being required to come to the office, things like, you know, what happens if the person who's sitting six feet away from me has COVID, you know, what do I do and how do I deal with that? You know, I think the, the key there was to, to get on top of those things very quickly to, to be sure that everybody was complying with the protocols that we'd established. Um, and, and I think it worked pretty well. Um, so overall, you know, I, when I look back, um, you know, and it's oftentimes much easier with hindsight to say, oh, it wasn't that bad. But there, there, there certainly were times when, um, you know, I think we were somewhat challenged in terms of, you know, what are we going to do now? Um, but we were always able to come up with yeah. the, uh, the solutions to that, which was great. Yeah, well, that's that's wonderful. Gordon, it has been a real pleasure talking with you and, and learning a little bit more about DHL and, and your approach, how you've uh, responded to this pandemic moment to focus on the needs of your people and, and still uh, allow for the organization to, uh, to really find success um, amidst the, the challenging circumstances. Uh, and to your point earlier, really, it's with with the people that we were able to do that. Without focusing on our people, uh, ultimately, we're not going to uh, be able to provide the products and services uh, that are of value to the community uh, and to our customers. And and we're not going to have good customer uh, interactions. And so the bottom line is, you know, we can't 
shortcut and short change our people during difficult times. And, and sometimes that's what organizations do when they're trying to tighten the belt and trying to, to deal with cut budget, you know, to tight, uh, uh, difficult budget situations. Um, but the long-term implications of shortcutting your people, I think is, is something that should really give us pause. And it's, it's been a, a real pleasure to hear about everything that DHL has done to try to, to tackle that. Uh, before we close today, I did want to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about what you're up to, and then just give us the last word on the topic for today. Great. So uh, my, my email address is gordon.simpson at dhl.com. Um, and uh, I think as far as last words are concerned, you know, we, we're certainly hoping that, uh, you know, in the coming months, as more and more people around the globe get vaccinated, that uh, we will get to uh, uh, a situation where, where people are going back to the office. I don't believe that we'll ever get back to, to where we were. I think there are a number of, of key things that, uh, that we've learned over this time frame. Um, and I think that many of those learnings we will be, be able to carry on into the future, right? So, so things like, you know, travel, things like, you know, the, the, the need for everybody to be working in the office. Um, some of those things, I think, uh, have changed fundamentally, and I, I doubt we'll ever um, see the kind of world of work that we saw pre-COVID. So um, looking forward to, to the challenges that lie ahead, but, uh, you know, I think that in the coming months, we, we certainly will see uh, a bit of um, relaxing of the, uh, of the limitations and, uh, and some of the regulations that exist and get back to... Uh, to a sense of normalcy where, um, where we can uh, continue to, to benefit organizationally and individually. So really appreciate the time and uh, thank you so much indeed, Jonathan, for the opportunity and uh, take care, stay safe and uh, we'll talk again. Yeah, thank you so much, Gordon. It has been a real pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.